Welcome to Ask Win. And today with me this morning, I have the fabulous Chris with me. And the fabulous Chris, even though she does not do interviews because her show, No Extra Words, which you guys should all check out, um, is a short story podcast, and she writes short stories. She's also a librarian at her day job, so she's going to try and interview me, and we're going to see how it goes, and <laughs> even though she's not used to interviewing her, I'm letting her take control, and we're going to see how it goes, and then we're just going to see how it goes, because she um, she thought I was going to interview her, but I turn the tables on her, so we'll just see how it goes. So bear with us, and then we'll just see how it goes. So I'm going to let the fabulous Chris take it away. Yay. Thank you for letting me on the show, and thank you for letting me try this this grand experiment. Um, and for your listeners, Wynn and I don't know each other incredibly well, so I took this as an opportunity for, to get to know Wynn better, so I have some questions, mostly just for my own curiosity, and I wanted to start with, I think a lot of us who are writers dream of being writers from the time that we're little, so I know that you are a writer as am I, so I'm curious, when you first started writing or when you first started dreaming of becoming a writer, what kind of writer did you want to be and what and how has that changed on your writing journey? Man, you sure could thought at me for the first <laughs> question. Well, I I was lucky enough and a lot of people don't know this. I well, a lot of people do know this. I was lucky enough to um not had CP in the sense that you would think I had CP. I was raised as a able-bodied woman, and people threw, oh, Lynn had CP as a side note in. So that being said, I was lucky enough my eighth grade year, my elementary school years, to go to Washington, D.C., where uh, National Public Radio is so the dream of becoming a writer um, for me first started out with podcasting because I saw at the time these big huge beautiful microphones and I thought now this was coming from my age later I thought I have the gift of speaking. I can interview people. I'm always curious if they kill the cat person there. And so I thought, well, maybe someday I will get into that. And then I had a stop and smell the roses moment in my life, actually, two of them. Um, one was in 06. I had a spinal fusion go horribly long, actually, they almost killed me, and they gave me propofol and fusion syndrome, which means your blood turns acidic and you have allergic reaction to the anesthesia, which most people who are allergic to propofol get that same reaction. I am one of millions of people that are allergic that is allergic to propofol, so that's the only severe medication I'm allergic to. And how people know it is Michael Jackson died of propofol and fusion syndrome. So when I had that stuff and smell the roses moment, I started creating my book in 2006 in the hospital bed. But it didn't really come to manifest again until 2012. And so when I lost my biological mom to meningitis and to a brain aneurysm, she went into the hospital 
and with the brain aneurysm, they clotted the brain aneurysm. She was fully functioning. Turns out that hockey players came in to um, the hospital with meningitis. I believe they affected 11 families in the ICU. We were one of them, and um, we were one of them, and the hospital still hasn't it minute. So now I'm slowly but slowly now when I finish my, when I get to the summer portion of my journalism program, I'm actually going to write a book on meningitis with research and do all that because I don't want other families to go through the heartbreak that I did. I mean, Mm -hmm. here we are, um, and my family did, because here we are, we, um, they caught caught the way in the end, she was making, my mom was making a list from a hospital bed, it's only functioning, she was reminding me of stuff that I had forgotten, and then, um, as I said, the meningitis took it out. So she did not die of a brain aneurysm. She died of viral meningitis, which cannot be cured. I know that. So I'm mm-hmm. slowly but surely preparing myself for that deep journey because that's going to be deep with research. And I'm actually uh, bringing on meningitis experts to this podcast so I could get to the bottom of this and I may even contact the hospital where this happened to see if they can finally tell me what happened because I was only 23 at the time and they they didn't even want to tell my family who was doctors. They didn't even want to say this is what we did, we tried to give this woman the strongest medication that we had. It didn't work. And so we went round the robin with the doctors, and they still haven't really come out of the woodwork to admit, okay, this is what happened. If you want to um, take legal procedures, please do. And uh, I don't know. If it was a, um, if it was all 11 families that they haven't admitted to, but um, us certainly not. Wow. I don't think you know this, but this is one of the things that you and I have in common is we both lost moms young, and we both lost moms pretty suddenly. And something like that, I think, really rattled you way down deep. How did you... What was your recovery like to come back from that loss of your mom? Did it change directions in your life? Did it – obviously, it impacted yeah. the topic of your writing, but yeah. how do you journey and, back uh, from a loss like that? How how do I journey back from a loss like that? Well, I, um, I used the pen as my therapist. I mean, basically, I did go to – traditional therapy after that. Yes, people will call me crazy. Yes, I'm mentally stable, but I use the pen as my therapist. I went, um, I was lucky enough to go to a um, leadership workshop on not necessarily how to deal with your disability, but how to be a better person with a disability. And one of the things they um, made all the participants do, I mean, we had participants in wheelchairs, we had participants with autism, we had participants with traumatic brain injuries from a skiing accident, we had participants with CP, and most of those kids dreamed about jumping on an airplane, during the about taking their first vacation. Well, when I did my vision board, yes, they made me write a vision board, and they made me say it in front of 12 people. 
and I said I want to go back to school for my art. They didn't think that was too nuts. But when I said I want to write a book and have it published, everyone, including my own dad, looked at me like I was nuts because um, <laughs> this was seven, six months after my mom died. And so everyone looked at me like I was nuts. And But they wrote it down. And the funny thing was, I gave myself a year to write I Come a Win, which was, which is my original book, which is still found on Amazon to this day. You guys, if you want to go check that out. And so within a year, we had a um, reunion of this workshop. And... I was able to say that my book was at the editors. Um, I finished the book. I my book is now at the editors, and people almost hit the ground. The jaws almost hit the floor because they didn't believe in me. I mean, they're used to kids with disabilities saying, "I want to jump on an airplane. I want to take." my first vacation with my family, they're not used to a young woman in the 20s at the time and saying, I want to write a book, I want to have it published, I want to share my story with with the world about cerebral palsy. Yeah. So I Come Away is a memoir, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, what's it like to write a memoir in your 20s? Like, you're certainly not the first person to ever have done it, and I know memoirs often cover a phase of your life, but okay, so you're in your 20s, and you've set this ambitious goal for yourself that you met. So you're 20-something years old, and you've now written your memoir. Where do you go from there? I, yeah, yeah, that's, I, uh, um, well, I, what did I do? I produced another memoir. I'm slowly but surely producing a book all about scoliosis because I'm one of those um, tens of thousands that has scoliosis because they can't um, totally fix the spine. That will be called CP fusion or something along the lines of that. (laughs) And so now I am a stronger I'm actually a stronger fiction writer than I am mm-hmm. um, a memoir writer because people don't, people, even though they love me and even though they love my story, people get sick of hearing about their <laughs> before And like, yeah, they're like, what is going on there? Another book, some of them about cerebral palsy. We like a fiction better than, um, better than the memoirs, although I have discovered that um, memo, that fiction doesn't sell um, nearly as well as memoirs, but that's okay. People seem to like my, me- people seem to like my fiction better than they like my memoirs because it's hard to me to write memoirs. It's hard for me to write to begin with. I mean, I use Apple's speech dictation to write full on chapters. I use Siri, then send it off to my editing team to make it all pretty. So I'm like, let's just, I consider myself a novelist. And then I'm also in the process of trying to work with an agent and get on the New York Times bestseller list. And here's a tip. For you guys, if you want to um, write a memoir and present it to an agent, most agents are going to take it as 50,000 words, one, and most agents won't take a memoir because the average Joe isn't a household name. Let's say the, um, let's say the real housewife's of Beverly Hills 
when they have a memoir, they can get on the New York Times bestseller list in two seconds flat. When the rest of us have a memoir, we can't because the agents are scanned that it's not going to sell, which is a viable thing. So the way I was doing it and the way insiders have told me um, they go win, you want to be presented on the New York Times they sell with us, why not start with an novel and then see how that goes? And so I'm slowly rewriting my novel, which I thought was going to be self-published, to present in front of the agent. And that's going to be ready in March, so my ghostwriter says. And then I'm going to try and do that again. And I'm not giving up on the New York Times bestseller list, but um, this has been a slow process, slower than I thought. I knew it was going to be slow, but I didn't realize until our insider told me that it was going to be like this. I thought I was going to present a query letter and a synopsis and my book to agents. I and I'm I didn't I didn't think they were going to say yes right away, but I didn't know um, that agents require a certain amount of effort and a certain amount of words, and then I didn't know that it's easier to get a novel onto the New York Times bestseller list than it is a memoir. Well, and novels are a sticky thing because, it, yeah, they, they they fall in so many different categories. Anyway, yeah. um, so yeah, you yeah. you do it all yeah. with what I'm hearing because you have so you 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 published your memoir in your 20s because you said you were gonna basically I'm gonna write a book in a year yeah and you did yeah. and published your memoir yeah you're currently working on pitching a novel that you would like to have published. Yeah. In, in in the world of li- librarians, we call that, quote-unquote, traditional publishing, when you go through an agent and through a publisher. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you publish yeah. your your memoir, indie publishing, and now you're going to try to publish your novel, traditional publishing. And in the middle of all that, you're getting a degree in journalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, there's, that, that was a segment of writing you hadn't taken on yet. Where does journalism fit into your puzzle? Where did you decide that you wanted to be a journalist? Well, I um, I was lucky enough to do the Kona Ironman. And for those of you that don't know what the Kona Ironman is, the Kona Ironman is an Olympic distance triathlon, which means the reason why I make such a big deal out of it, and yes, it's filmed by NBC, and yes, we do all that, but the reason why they make such a big deal out of the Kona Ironman is because it's one of the worst swim, biking, swim, biking runs that people ever do in their lives. And I only did the swim and the bike, but unfortunately due to the way my bike, the way my teammate set up my bike, we weren't able to do, we weren't able to finish the Kona Ironman. And I thought about this on the swim of the Kona Ironman that I want to be on the outside interviewing, um, possibly interviewing all these famous triathletes because triathletes need a little diversity factor. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to go back to journalism school, but I held that secret until March of March of 2017 or maybe March of 2016. So, and then I decided, well, instead of going back to traditional journalism school, why not go back to fashion journalism school, so that's what I'm doing. Oh, wow. 
So, as you mentioned in the intro, I'm a librarian, and so I hear yeah. a lot about my my job being obsolete, which I think is funny, but I hear that a lot, <laughs> and I'm fairly certain that you in journalism hear that a lot as well, that why are you getting a degree in a field like journalism? There aren't going to be any journalists in X yes. years, which, by the way, yes, I don't I believe, do. but I'm sure you hear that a lot. So what do you tell I people do. who who tell you this is the wrong time to become a journalist? What, what's your answer to those people? What do I tell people? Um, what do I tell people when they say you're going into a field with fake news? Hint, hint. I uh, <laughs> tell people to. I tell people. Well, the journalism skill. Um, the journalism skill needs diversity, and they need a diversity factor of disabilities because. They, um, the, especially the fashion journalism field, it's so weird because they talk about skinny toothpick models. I actually did a book about this called The View from My Hill, which could still be found on Amazon. And I, um, I talked about the skinny toothpick models from a disabled perspective, and that's one of my novels. And the skinny toothpick models, um, the skinny toothpick models, excuse me, um, drive me nuts. And not only the industry drives me nuts. And talking about this, oh, I want to be a model, I want to make a living, drives me nuts. And I don't, I think that the, um, Modeling industry and the New York Fashion Week and the Paris Fashion Week need the diversity factor. I also think that librarians also don't have a dying job. They are needed more than ever, although um, the Kindle is now coming into libraries. But I think we're, we're needed more than ever. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you on that. It's it's not so much that the job is going away, it's that the job is changing. It's that the world is changing and the job is yeah. changing. And that's yeah. what I think people don't get, because when they hear the word journalist or they hear the word librarian, they get a very specific picture in their head of what that used to look like 30, 40 years ago. And it's, you know, it's very, very different now, but still still a very interesting job. So, okay, yeah. so you're you're finishing up a degree in journalism working on pitching your novel to an agent. And, and I is is there anything left undone for you? Is there any part of this creative process that you haven't tackled yet that you're ready to take on? I, I mean, you're doing about 6,000 things, so I, yeah. but I can only imagine that you have mountains yet to climb in your future. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, after this, after this, I was going to go back to school and get an MFA, but uh, maybe a doctor in, in education. But I decided that student loans are the death of all of us. <laughs> and yep. I decided <laughs> educate yourself when this is um, this is uh, interesting experiment. Um, it's going to be an interesting degree, but after I get this degree, which I'm still working on, I'm going to quit educating myself because I'm like, I don't need any more stress in my life. I don't need um, any more student loan debt, which I have, you guys. I have, <laughs> and um, Chris will tell you, and I don't know about Chris's um, career field, but Chris will tell you if librarians and teachers don't get paid that high, and so especially if you're in the elementary school area, and so teachers don't get paid that high in general. So I thought I thought about this long and hard over this week, over this past weekend. I thought, well, do I really want to go back to school and get it? MFA, and it's like, no, no, stick with your associate's degree, please. Just finish that out and then call it good. 
You said you were going to stop educating yourself. I don't think you're going to stop educating yourself. I don't think you could if you tried. I think you're going to stop paying instructors to teach you. Yeah. I think you're going to yeah. go. Yeah. Um, that, there's... That, that, that's a cliff. I'll um, always be a like one when I'll just stop the institution end of it. <laughs> I have days like that, too, where it's like, oh, I want more school. I want a master's degree. I want to change fields. It's like, no, right now everything's paid for. I paid off all those student loans on my master's yeah. degree. I'm not sure. I, I yeah. look enviously at people who do MFA and creative writing programs, and I think those programs have real value. But I also think, you know, there's there's voices for those of us outside of that field, too, and, and we're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. No, well, um I will always be a lifelong one of you guys. I I will just stop the institution end of it after um, spring of 2019. I'm stopping the institution end of it, which I'm so happy about. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm like yeah. still, still with a million other things and not for the week at heart. And I have one more question. I have one more question. So, you know, yes. your your journey, it sounds like, really started in a lot of ways with the loss of your mom and the goals that you set for yourself kind of coming out of that. And you talked about how even your family thought you were kind of nuts when that was sort of your reaction. What yes. does your family think now of your journey and how it's gone? What, what kind of feedback do you get from your family now? Well, I um, – I, Luckily, I have a very supportive family. I have now, I have a stepmom and now who's also very supportive. And I live with my dad and my stepmom. So, um, they are very supportive. My dad is also supportive of me going back to journalism school and finally getting my degree. Um, at the like old beach of thirty <laughs> or in my thirties. And then um my my family I do have some family dynamics that um you guys don't know about. But um other than that my family is very supportive but it's gonna be a long and interesting journey when when I hit the New York Sun, that's a little bit. It's not going to be if, you guys. It's going to be when. And it's going to be a long and interesting journey about who comes out of the woodwork to find me now. And I'm just sticking to my guns and saying, if you don't like it, you can close the door and never come back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I I wouldn't want to be the one that crossed you. Let's put it that way. I think yeah. some, of the, the, some of the greatest people in this world, one of their greatest attributes has been stubbornness. And you definitely have that one going for you. So. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I have a question for you. What okay, made me. you become – what um, – Maybe you become a librarian. Um, I don't. I'm gonna be forty this year, and I don't think I still know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, oh. I found I found the library sort of by accident. <laughs> My best friend moved to an island. Is really the way it started. So I live in the Seattle area, and we have a couple of sub- suburbs that are actually on physical islands, and you have to take a ferry to get there. So my best friend moved yeah. to an island. And she said, you should come out here and live with me. And I said, well, what am I going to do for a job on an island? That doesn't even make sense. Um, and so she started reading the local – at the time, I was thinking about moving to Denver to be – to live with my sister. My sister was living in Denver at the time, and I was sort of unemployed and living at my dad's house. And so – but my best friend, she said, well, I'll just keep looking in the newspaper, and I'll see if I can find a job for you. And she found this – job ad in a local newspaper for someone to work at this little small town library on an island and she said you got to apply for this it's perfect for you because it was the person who was going to sort of be the story time lady and you know all that kind of stuff at the yeah. library and 
I thought, what the heck? So I applied and got an interview and ended up bailing on the move to Denver with my sister to take the interview. I don't think my, this was like 14 some odd years ago. I don't think my sister's forgiven me to date. Um, but took this interview and it took, oh my gosh, forever to get offered this job. So I had the interview and it was one of those things I would call the library like every 72 hours for like a week and a half. So I'm still interested in the job, you know, do you need anything else from me? And this very nice lady who became my boss, she she kept saying, I'm so glad you're still interested. We're still working on it. We'll be in touch. And I think based on what I know now, she was behind the scenes arguing with the hiring committee, trying to get them to give me a chance at this job because everyone else who applied for this job had more library experience than I did. And I later learned when I was given the job, all the people in this library system that I met in the first year I was there either had once had the job that I had and had been promoted or had applied for the job that I had and hadn't gotten it. So it was, everybody was in one of those two categories. But yeah. I ended up being offered the job, and it was like – it was part-time, but it was enough to live on at the time. So I worked like 30 hours a week, and I lived on this island, and – um and I worked in the library, and it was just such a good fit for me. It was such a natural fit. And so I ended up – my dad had been pressuring me to get a master's degree in something, mostly because I think he didn't want me unemployed and in his house anymore. And Because at that point, I had, for several years, had been on this cycle where I could find, like, jobs and work for myself for nine, ten months at a time, and then I would end up back at my dad's house. I think he was kind of done with that cycle. Because when I got this job, I was 25, yeah. I think. So I – Got the job and then ended up getting a master's degree in library science and ended up bopping around because I then got my first kind of real grown-up library job post-master's degree that was full-time and all that kind of stuff. And then met the man who's now my husband and tried to relocate to get closer to where he was because he lived an hour away from me at that point. And so I ended up transferring library systems a couple times and then I spent four years as school librarian and then had my son, and so I now work, I work basically on call. So I am the person that the library system calls when they need somebody to work a desk because it gives me flexible hours so I can be home with my three-year-old and all that kind of stuff. So I really, really, really like being in libraries. I've been a children's librarian. I've been a school librarian. Um, It is The only thing that's not fun about it is that you feel like you spend your life defending your job because there is a large segment population that thinks that libraries are unnecessary and outdated and why are we still spending money on them. Um, the, the Literally the first day I met my new boss after I was hired as a school librarian, she said, what a luxury to have an actual librarian in the building. I'm like, oh, good. The person who's in charge of my job literally thinks I'm a luxury. That's not a good sign for anybody's oh, future. So. Now, uh, <laughs> it's, it's similar to my, um, my job. Basically, I... <laughs> Basically, I was a student there um, at where I teach now, and basically, they uh, pretty much say, and my colleagues um, who listen to this podcast will know how I truly feel, they pretty much think the same way your boss did, that having an age is a luxury, and so they, uh, I spend a lot of my time depending why the aides should stay in the classroom and why teachers should get paid higher. And I now will be spending a lot of my time on the journalism side because I'm, people think I'm not going into walking away from a um, job that's stable and going into a bigger fight than I was originally in. Because people don't get behind the scenes of a library. People don't get behind the scenes of a educational institute. And they just think we're luxury, Chris. They just literally do think we're lux- luxury. We're not, I'm sorry, but we're not. <laughs> you, uh, you just to our full potential. So I, yeah, I have a master's degree in library science, and that's what I do now, and I don't know that I'll do it forever, but it has been, working in libraries has been a real gift for me, and one of the things that I learned, especially when I was in school, is the boss may not have understood, but my students and the teachers that I worked in support of 
were so grateful of the services that the library provided. And so you have to kind of get yeah. out of the mode of dealing with administrators and higher-ups and really focus on dealing yeah. with the, the clients, the people that you're serving, because yeah. it makes a huge difference. The school that I worked at was a specialty school that served kids with dyslexia and reading disabilities specifically. So I spent a lot of time one-on-one with those kids, really helping them find books they could read that were accessible to them, um, that were at their level, really trying to help kids who don't read very well and have never been set up to like reading to be able to find things they were passionate about. And that was incredibly inspiring. So, you know, once you can get aside from all of that other stuff. But, yeah, I don't know what my future holds in libraries, but I have been so grateful to have randomly stumbled into this profession that has given me an awful lot. So. That has given you an awful lot. Well, I thank you for interviewing me. I know that was a little bit of your comfort zone, but I thank you for interviewing me. And go check out No Extra Words. And No Extra Words is in Spotify, you guys, so you can listen to it on good speakers. And um, because I know you guys have good speakers as well in all iPhones. And so, no extra words, ask when is in Spotify. So please, 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 please share no extra words out. And please, please, please share ask when out because we need all the new fans we can get. I mean, I have been watching Chris's journey and she loves writing as much as I do and she loves books as much as I do, and please, please, please just support the independent artist, and please support the local library, because they're not dying, you guys. Nope. Libraries are still in existence, even though the Kindle book is more popular than a book book, but libraries are still in existence, and then goes my PSA for this morning, please Go to that story hour with your kids. I know we have it here. Please support the local library as much as you can because librarians need your support and we need to quit defending why libraries need to be still in existence. And if you guys support local libraries, that's going to be the icing on cake because you can have your cake and eat it too, as Chris said, but if we're going to keep defending about why libraries need to be still in existence, Chris and myself won't have jobs anymore because we can't focus on our work. We, well, and library, we librarians, love, librarians love to support local writers. That's one of the things we yeah. enjoy doing is we, yeah. we like promoting exactly. you and we like talking about your work. So what I would tell local authors, don't bother your local librarians. Don't spam them and send them free copies of your book they didn't ask for. But yeah. go shake hands with them and say hi and introduce yeah. yourself and meet them and talk to them about what you're doing. And, yeah, they'll promote you because yeah. we like doing that. They'll, pro- they'll promote. They'll, uh, yeah, they'll promote. And I actually um, got my I come a win in the Denver Public Library, and um, thanks to a family member who actually was my guys, and um, he said to library put my niece's book in the library. The next thing I know, my book is in the Denver Public Library. They have a couple copies of it, so. Please go support your libraries, and please go introduce yourself as your independent public author. I'm sure they need more book signings, and or go to your um, local independent bookstore and then oh, yeah. try that trick too. But the um, Chris says, "Oh yeah, totally." But um, the libraries are going to work in our favor, especially with the government. Shut down. Thank you very much. They may not be open today, but um, as soon as the government shutdown is over, they're going to be open and they're going to be looking 
to help people and support people. Yeah. So that's I think like a my lot PSA. of like a lot of government agencies, libraries are open today, but but running on a little bit of a deficit because some of the things yeah. that we depend on, like Library of, Catalog, Library of Congress catalog subheadings and some of that kind of stuff yeah. that helps from the federal government, all of that is non-operational today. So yeah. hopefully that will be short-lived, fingers crossed. Well, Thanks thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to interview you. This was really fun. I don't, I don't, I don't have welcome. an interview show, so I don't – and good luck. I know – like. Welcome. Like, No Extra Words is going through a little bit of a, a format change and a shake-up, and I know Ask Lynn is, too. So good luck on your creative podcasting journey. Well, thank you, sir. And it was honored to have you interview me, and I hope you guys enjoyed my interview with Cliff, and um, I hope you guys share No Extra Words out and share Ask Lynn out, and we'll See you later, and we'll keep going and support all people that we can. Thanks, you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Lynn.